There are 2 million students in Ontario schools. Of them, at least a third of a million has a disability, a physical, mental, sensory, communication, learning, intellectual, mental health, or other kind of disability. What can we do to ensure that students with disabilities can fully benefit from Ontario's education system? We have a once in a generation opportunity this summer to have our say. Let me tell you how and why and what you can do about it. My name is David Lepofsky. I'm a visiting professor at the Osgoode Hall Law School. I'm also chair of the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act Alliance, a grassroots nonpartisan disability advocacy coalition. I've got some other titles that bear on today's talk as well. I'm a member and formerly the chair of the Special Education Advisory Committee for Canada's largest school board, the Toronto District School Board, which itself has as many as 50,000 students with disabilities within its population it serves. And finally, uh, I'm a member of the government-appointed Kindergarten to Grade 12 Education Standards Development Committee. That's a mouthful. I can explain what that is. That committee has issued a, a, an initial report with draft or initial recommendations on what should be done to make Ontario's uh, school system barrier-free, inclusive, and accessible for all students with disabilities. Over the summer of 2021, up until September the 2nd, it's open to anyone in the public to offer their feedback on those draft recommendations. It's important that you offer your feedback, whether you're a parent, whether you're a person with a disability who's a student or a former student, whether you're an educator, whether you work somewhere in the education system or in government, or you just have a general interest in the subject of making sure that all kids get a fair opportunity to learn and benefit from our school system. So how am I going to address this? What I'd like to do is first tell you what this is all about, what the issue is. I'm going to give you some ideas on how you can take part. I'm going to review for you the major themes in the recommendations of the Kindergarten to Grade 12 Standards Development Committee that, that we'll be uh, talking about. And I'm going to give you access to or point you to some important resources that will help you out. Let me be clear from the outset. I'm speaking today in my personal capacity on behalf of me. I'm not speaking for the entire K to 12 uh, Education Standards Development Committee. They have spoken in a comprehensive report in which I was involved, one of the many people involved in putting it together. Their report speaks for their collective views. I'm going to share my perspective on this uh, in this presentation, but I encourage you to read their entire recommenda uh, set of recommendations and to offer your feedback. So what the heck is this all about? In 2005, the Ontario legislature passed a very important law called the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, or AODA. It passed it unanimously. All parties supported it. I had the privilege of leading the decade-long campaign to get that law enacted. That law is designed to ensure that Ontario becomes accessible to people with disabilities. Uh, and the way it is to be achieved is by the government enacting a series of regulations, those are enforceable laws, that will spell out what organizations need to do to become accessible, and then the province is supposed to enforce those, uh, those regulations. Those regulations are called accessibility standards, and they're, they're to be made on a sector-by-sector -sector basis. What does that mean? It means, for example, we have a transportation accessibility standard already on the books, which is supposed to make our public transit system accessible to people with disabilities. Well, we and others campaigned for many years to get the government to agree, and the government has agreed, that they should develop one of those regulations to address the barriers facing students with disabilities in their education. It will be called an Education Accessibility Standard. The first stage in developing that standard is for the government to appoint 
an arm's length advisory committee, it's called the Standards Development Committee, which will give its advice to the government on what that accessibility standard should include. So for example, the government appointed just such a committee called the K-12 Education Standards Development Committee, that's the big mouthful, and its responsibility is to come up with recommendations for the provincial government on what that education accessibility standard should include for uh, students between kindergarten and grade 12. There's another committee, which I won't be talking about today, which is addressing barriers in post-secondary education, that's college and university. Who's on the committee? Well, it's an advisory committee. It doesn't write the regulations, it just makes recommendations. Well, as I said before, I'm one of the people on the committee. The committee is uh, made up of 50% members coming from the disability community and 50% of members coming from the education community. So think of it as including the two fields of expertise that you need at the table. And our members include uh, people with expertise in a range of different disabilities and people with experience from school in the school administration process from teachers to school administrators to trustees. And we have worked together to develop a package of recommendations. We've spent a, a bunch of time writing a detailed report, more about that, what it includes in just a few minutes, but it's just a first draft. What we must do under the AODA is then make it public. And that happened on June 1st, 2021. And the public is invited to give us feedback. That's what we're talking about doing now. And between now and September, 20, uh, September 2nd, 2021, you can offer your feedback. You send it to the government, more on how to do that soon. And then that feedback will be given to our committee. Then our committee gets together uh, after that uh, consultation period, reviews all the feedback, and then we look at our draft report and our initial recommendations and decide how should this thing read in its final form. We can make any changes we feel is appropriate, influenced by the feedback we got. So this is your chance to let us know. So what would an accessibility standard include? It's supposed to spell out in detail what barriers uh, should be removed or prevented, barriers to accessibility facing people with disabilities. And it can set out timelines when that work has to get done by. And those timelines can vary depending on whether the organization is a large one or a small one. And then that regulation, once it's passed, is enforceable. Once we've rendered our final report to the government, the government can decide how much or how little of our recommendations um, it will adopt. So why do we need an education accessibility standard? Well, we need one because it's clear uh, that students with disabilities face a, a, a number of accessibility barriers throughout our education system. It's not because anybody sat down and said, hey, how do we design this system to be full of barriers? But as with what people with disabilities experience in public transit and lots of other aspects of life, in the education system, these barriers can arise. And our Standards Development Committee spent a lot of time trying to figure out what those barriers are and what should be done uh, to remove them. Well, where does this all come from? Speaking for myself, I believe it comes from the fact that our education system is built on a, from a starting point that it's mainly there to serve students without disabilities. And the buildings are built, the curriculum is designed, the equipment at our gyms and our playgrounds is purchased, the teachers are trained and so on, all on the assumption that they are going to be working, that they are for students without disabilities. And then students with disabilities come along kind of as, are treated as kind of an afterthought. What they're given is called special education. And that's to sort of fill the gaps of a system that really was never designed with the needs of people with disabilities uh, and students with disabilities uh, in mind. That's what we've inherited. Now, that's not to say that teachers and uh, uh and school staff don't care about students with disabilities or don't try to meet their needs, but they're handcuffed. They're handcuffed by a system that's both out of date 
and which does not give them the tools, the training, and the opportunities they need to be able to see in effectively teaching all learners. Now, if I, now I call this a once in a lifetime or generation opportunity because before uh, this uh, began, there had been no such comprehensive review of our school system from the perspective of students with disabilities and the barriers they face. The system uh, just kept running as it's been. Uh, moreover, the special education provisions uh, that are that are in our laws and in our practices, they were largely written or designed before we even had a charter of rights or before the Ontario Human Rights Code guaranteed equality to students with disabilities. So this all needs to be updated and this is the opportunity that you have to have your say. So how do you have your say? What do you do? I'm going to review for you some of the key themes that the Standards Development Committee identified. And I encourage you to give your feedback. There's a couple of ways you can do that. The government has posted online an online survey that you can fill out. It's a bit complicated and it will take a certain amount of time. The other opportunity is for you to just email the government your thoughts. Just write them out and email them, whether they cover everything that the Standards Development Committee talked about or just some things that are important to you. And if you just do that, the information will get through to us on the committee and it will be helpful. In fact, if you do it on your own rather than using the government survey, uh, you might want to just think about answering four simple questions. First, do you like the recommendations that the Standard Development Committee made? And if there's any you don't like, Tell us, uh, mention those, but if the ones that you like, just indicate that you like them, or if you like them all, let us know. Second, uh, if what are your priorities? If there are some that are more important to you, uh, because there's a lot in the report, you might want to point out the ones that you think are going to make the biggest difference or that should be the top priority uh, for immediate action. Uh, third is, is there anything in the report you don't like? And if so, what should we change in our recommendations to address your concerns? What don't you like? Why don't you like them? And what can we do to fix them? And finally, is there anything we left out? Now, you might think you're in a 185-page report that we spent months developing, that we, we've captured everything, but we could well have missed some things, and we'd like to know what those are. It would be really helpful. So those are the four questions that would be really helpful to share. Now, who can you share them with? There's several opportunities. You can do it on your own personal behalf. On the other hand, if you're part of an organization, the organization might want to have their say and you might want to uh, encourage them to make sure that they, uh, they take part in this. Um, now, uh, let me now take you through very quickly the uh, recommendations themes. Now, the the best way to absorb all this information is to read the entire uh, report, and I encourage you to do so. A link will be included with this video. But the AODA Alliance has also given you uh, a couple of tools that may help you if you don't have the time to do to read the whole thing. Uh, we've got a 55-page uh, condensed version, uh, and it includes some annotations from the AODA Alliance. That's speaking for the AODA Alliance, not for the whole Standards Development Committee. And any of this uh, condensing, uh, we're responsible for. If we left out things that uh, others consider important, uh, it's our fault. It's certainly not the responsibility of the Standards Development Committee. We also made available, for people who don't even have the time to read that 55-page version, we provided a 15-page summary. Now, it's a summary. It doesn't cover everything. But again, we hope you'll find it helpful. Links to those two documents will also be included with this lecture. We've also provided you with an action kit on how to have your input, and that's good. a link to that will be available uh, on uh, with this lecture as well. So let's jump into uh, the meat of our discussion today. What are the themes that our recommendations include? Well, first we set out, the Standards Development Committee sets out a long-term goal for the, or objective for the standard, uh, for the Education Accessibility Standard. And to put it simply, 
The, the objective is to ensure that Ontario's education system becomes accessible to students with disabilities and barrier-free by 2025, and does so through two means. First, by removing and preventing barriers in the system, and second, by providing students with disabilities and their family with a fair, expeditious uh, uh, method for having their individual needs accommodated uh, where individual accommodations are required. So we then offer uh, the AODA Alliance, a summary and condensed version, break the recommendations down into 20 themes. Now, those are our divisions, not the way the Standard Development Committee di uh, did it. We kind of looked at their at the report and come, came up with a way to try to make it a little uh, more simplified. The first theme, the first theme are recommendations to ensure that schools serve all students with disabilities. Well, what's the problem here? The problem is, um, and if you work in the education system, you know this terminology, the Education Act and regulations and policies and practices are not designed to ensure that our special education program serves all students with disabilities. It only is designed to serve some. They create this term. It's a term that I frankly find troubling. It's called exceptionality. And then if a student has an exceptionality, then they are entitled to special education. If they don't have one, uh, they're not entitled to special education. Well, the problem is that there are two flaws with the term exceptionality. First, it does not include all disabilities. The way it's defined does not include all disabilities. We need to serve all kids with disabilities. And second, it actually includes some kids who have no disabilities. Now, we're not trying to take any educational opportunity away from any student, but we just want to make sure that there's a program in place and a strategy and a policy and laws in place that are designed to ensure that all students with disabilities have their right to be educated fully uh, honored. So therefore, a theme throughout the recommendations is that Ontario has to revise the way it delivers education so that it provides it for uh, and, and its, its supports are provided for all students with disabilities. And let's get away from this term exceptionality, which um, is out of date, is predates the Charter of Rights and is, is um, I believe, inconsistent with the Charter of Rights. Okay, our second theme. Our second theme is uh, that there needs to be appropriate training throughout the education system on how to effectively meet the needs of students with disabilities and on the importance of ensuring that education is accessible and barrier free. That includes obviously uh, added training for anybody who does the educating, teachers, teachers assistants and so on. Now I'm not saying they have no training in this, but they need considerably more than they've been offered or provided in their teachers education. Um, but also, this training is needed for school staff, school administrators, uh, principals, uh, senior managers in the education system. Um, and as well, um, it would be useful to provide training uh, for parents of kids in the school system because that will provide um, assistance to them uh, and benefit them. But even students would benefit from this training. And we, we the Standards Development Committee recommends has recommendations that focus on the need to provide educational curriculum for students in the school system, all students, on the uh, capacity for student for people with disabilities to fully participate in society, on the importance of accessibility and the benefits of, of their being uh, included and in fully participating. Um, that kind of curriculum could have a long-term benefit uh, for everyone. And frankly, when kids do get education on that, because some do, they find it really interesting and they find it, uh, uh, they welcome it. Our third theme, we have to remove and prevent digital barriers uh, uh, that face students with disabilities. Now this is where things can get a bit uh, IT technical and I'm just gonna summarize. But just, we know that education is moving more and more to the digital world both distance learning, but also learning in the classroom. Computers, tablets, and so on are all important parts uh, of education. But up until now, our education system has not made sure that it has an accessible digital environment for students with disabilities. 
or for teachers with disabilities or anyone else in the education system with disabilities. So we offer a series of recommendations uh, on how to do this, how to make sure that, they, that the school board only procures accessible hardware, software programs, and so on, how to make sure that the documents that are uh, made available for use in the education system are accessible. Let me give you a practical one you might not know. Commonly, people share information in a PDF format. PDF can present serious accessibility problems and no one writes uh, in PDF. As a blind person, I can tell you when people send me a PDF, I just say, can you please send it to me in, in Microsoft Word, which is probably what they wrote it in. And it's easy enough to share the document in a non-PDF format and that helps people who are blind or dyslexic or have certain other disabilities related to print, uh, helps them access it. So it's easy and cost nothing to make sure that documents that are provided in PDF are also available uh, in an accessible format. Digital barriers in distance learning. Well, with the COVID pandemic, we've learned lots about the problems and difficulties engaging in distance learning. It creates particular barriers for students with disabilities. We need strategies to address this, to make sure the digital platform that's being used for meetings and classes are fully accessible. Some school boards aren't using the most accessible platforms. Um, this has been a real problem during the COVID pandemic. We need to solve this problem. The government during the COVID pandemic you, uh, relied on TV Ontario to provide uh, online some of the online learning materials. Yep, my coalition, the AODA Alliance, we revealed uh, in May of 2020 that TV, TVO's online learning materials have serious accessibility problems. And as of the date I'm recording this, we haven't seen a plan for them to even fix those. Now, let me, so the, there, there's, we, we recommend a series of actions to be taken to ensure that public money is not used to create digital barriers, but instead that we ensure that there's proper digital accessibility for students uh, with disabilities. Uh, what's the next theme? The fourth theme that's important in these recommendations um, is ensuring accessibility of curriculum, teaching instruction, and testing or evaluation. Now, up until now, when I talk about things like computers or software you buy, I might think of a concrete thing to just find out which ones are accessible, which aren't. But accessibility is also important in the way we design our curriculums uh, and uh, curricula, and in the way teachers actually come up with their lesson plans in the classroom, and to also uh, the way we test or assess how much students are learning. There's an overarching principle that is internationally recognized for this. It's called Universal Design and Learning, or UDL. What it means is that we should be teaching in a way that teaches all learners. Some learners are visual learners. We gotta ensure we meet their needs. Some are more audio learners and are not visual learners at all. We shouldn't use a teaching method that just serves one and excludes the other. That, comes, that applies to how we design our curriculums, how we, a teacher takes the curriculum and turns it into a lesson plan and delivers it, and to how we test students. So we've got detailed recommendations on how to embed this in our teaching, our, our training for teachers and requiring it for, uh, uh, as a, an approach to teaching in our schools. Now we're not saying no one uses it, but not enough people are using it. And we don't do enough to make sure uh, that those who are designing our curricula and who are doing our teachers employ this. This applies both to school, uh, what goes on in the school, as well as to provincial curriculum that's set at the provincial level and to prevent province-wide standardized testing. We've got to make sure that that doesn't include any uh, accessibility barriers either. Our fifth theme. Boy, this one's important, though they all are. It is very important for us to strengthen and uh, fortify um, what are called individual education plans or IEPs. What is an IEP? Some of you watching this know it very well. Some have not heard the term before. We've had on the books for years a requirement that students with special education needs are entitled to have the school board create a plan for how they're going to meet 
their additional learning needs, an individual education plan. What they're going to do for that student over and above what's ordinarily done in the classroom to ensure that that student is capable of learning. They're supposed to be individualized and tailored to the individual needs. It's a good idea, but we found that there were lots of problems with how it's being done. And here are just a few of the many recommendations that are central uh, to what the K-12 Standards Development Committee is recommending. First, uh, an IEP should be available to all students with a disability who want or need one, not just students with an exceptionality. Remember I said before, that's a term our law uses to define who can have special education supports, and it doesn't include all disabilities. This is one of the ways to fix that, uh, uh, that problem with our education system. Extend IEPs to be available to any student who needs one or wants one or would benefit from one. As well, the individual education plan should address comprehensively in one place all of the students' learning and school-related needs, uh, formal and informal, to the extent that they can. Now, that is a, a quick summary of what is a huge topic, but I'm going to jump quickly to a, another theme that is um, equally huge and equally important. Theme number six is extending and enhancing parent participation in addressing the disability-related needs of students with disabilities. The problem that we've identified, and others have too, is that many parents, too many parents, uh, find it extremely hard to find out what's available for their child at their school system to meet their disability-related needs and how to advocate for them. And even if they find out that information, they find the process of trying to have their say uh, is, uh, depending on which school, which school board they're at, uh, could be a very frustrating, demoralizing, and difficult one. Now, again, I'm not saying, and we're not saying that no one is serving any of these students or anybody wants to not be helpful. But again, this is where an outdated system handcuffs those who really want to effectively serve uh, these uh, students. Now, before uh, these recommendations came out, I recorded uh, a video for with practical tips for parents on how to advocate for the needs of students with disabilities in school. I'm going to include a link with that with this video. And I encourage you to watch it. We've gotten very positive feedback from students and uh, educators uh, that it was helpful. And as of the time I'm recording this, it's been seen over 2,000 times. And we're eager to see uh, all parents and all teachers see that video because it offers practical tips that would pr help them. And recommendations from the Standards Development Committee are very much in line with that video, or perhaps better, that video is very much in line with what the Standards Development Committee recommended. One of the very concrete things that are, is recommended by the Standards Development Committee in this regard is that any student with disability uh, should have themselves and their parents, their family, offered a meeting with school board officials to talk about what should go in the individual education plan. Now, you'd think that's a pretty practical thing. And if parents ask for this, uh, they, they typically get such a meeting, but parents aren't necessarily told that they can ask. And so let's level the playing field. Let's make sure this is available to all parents who want such a meeting. It would be a meeting where the parents uh, and the student, if needed, and uh, any support uh, professionals or others that might help them get together with the school officials who are working with the child, put their heads together and say, what are this child's needs that are disability related? What are the best ways of achieving, uh, uh, of addressing those needs? And then co-authoring a plan which can be uh, uh, agreed upon, uh, which will be more beneficial for the child. We also uh, recommend that there should be in place a fair process for parents to address within the school board any disputes uh, if they're either the school doesn't agree to put something in the individual education plan that the family thinks is appropriate, uh, or if the individual education plan is good, but it's not being fully implemented according to the family. There should be somewhere they could go. They shouldn't have to go to the Human Rights Tribunal um, uh, to fight about these things. They should be a, a constructive uh, method for trying to mediate these issues within the school board. The existing system 
that's available is inadequate and we make recommendations on uh, how to prove how the standards development committee makes recommendations on, on how to improve it and we've also suggest as a practical matter that the school board should provide a system navigator for families who need it to help them navigate through this whole special education system because it's a complicated one. Theme number seven, access to timely professional assessments for students with disabilities. Some students with disabilities need to get a professional assessment. It might be a psychological assessment, might be another kind. Uh, in order to get their needs effectively met at school. There can be long delays for these, and we make recommendations on how to speed up that process and make accountable to the public the kind of delays that are now going on. Next, theme number eight. We, uh, the Standards Development Committee uh, recommends that there be a review of the process for deciding where students with disabilities individually are placed. There is a formal process that's been in our, our law in our law for uh, uh, before since before the Charter of Rights was enacted called an Identification and Placement Review Committee or IPRC. Um, it's meant to be family friendly. Uh, it's meant to be cooperative and collegial. But as a practical matter, the feedback is it's out of date uh, that many think it's out of date um, it's unduly bureaucratic. It can be very uh, uh, hard for families to uh, feel that they can effectively access it. So we recommend uh, uh, reform to it, that it be reviewed, reformed, or replaced. Um, with a, a swift, fair, and effective uh, process uh, that will meet children's needs more, students with disabilities needs more effectively. Uh, theme number nine. The ninth theme is that uh, we need to embed accessibility in the work of the Ministry of Education and of school boards. Where things are done right, they tend to be done right helter-skelter. There's no one in charge. There's no one with lead responsibility for ensuring that the accessibility, either at the Ministry of Education level uh, or at the school board level. So we make practical recommendations for steps that need to be put in place to achieve this. There should be an assistant deputy minister at the Ministry of Education who's got responsibility for this, including an obligation to maintain an ongoing review. Weird ones uh, on the K-12 Standards Development Committee doing the first such review in a generation. This shouldn't have to wait for another generation. It should part of be part of regular business at the Ministry of Education. Same at school board level, and we make practical suggestions, including each school board having an accessibility committee. Some do, and that's great. All should. But also recommending a local accessibility committee at each school where families, school staff can together identify where their local problems, try to come up with local solutions. Theme number 10. Uh, relate, we provide some recommendations related to some specific disabilities. There are some related to autism, uh, with respect to uh, kids with vision loss. We point out, uh, as parents of uh, children with vision loss have been pointing out for years without uh, any success, uh, that teachers of the visually impaired in Ontario uh, aren't required to meet the kind of training standards that are required in half of the other provinces in Canada and, and many other places and call for them to be upgraded. Now, you may find that there are other disability specific needs that should be addressed in the report and aren't. So that would be a great area for feedback too. Theme number 11 uh, is uh, our recommendations that call for the um, uh, restricting the use of the power of school principals to refuse to admit a student to school. Now this could be the subject of an entire talk on its own, but Stated briefly, each school principal has the power to refuse to admit a student to school if they think that their presence would be detrimental to the well-being of other students. Uh, this, uh, most school boards don't have a policy on how to do this and they get uh, limited direction from the province. We propose recommendations based on practices that different school boards are actually implementing, some here, some there, that would require, for example, that school boards uh, before they can refuse to admit a student, have to give the family reasons for the refusal to allow the student to come to school. There should be a time limit on the exclusion. There should be a fail, a fair fairness built into any appeal process, uh, and they should be provided 
uh, learning opportunities while they're away from school so that they don't um, suffer uh, loss uh, uh, in their education to the extent we can manage that. Uh, theme number uh, 12 uh, calls for an improvement of the Ministry of Education's collection of data on students with disabilities. Now you might initially think that's a bit remote from what it'll be do to serve uh, kids tomorrow, but the fact is um, the Ministry of Education collects all sorts of data on students with uh, on students and on educators and, and on so on. But their data collection on disability related issues is um, falls far short of what it should be. And, and that makes it harder to track where the problems are. So there are detailed recommendations on how the ministry should include uh, more data collection for on the education of students with disabilities. Um, theme 13. It involves recommendations on how to advance uh, the needs of students with disabilities in social realms. As a practical matter, for example, there are proposals um, to help avoid social isolation that some students with disabilities have. They may need staff help to um, in, in, interact with some other students socially um, um, and during informal time uh, and anti-bullying strategy, uh, anti strategies. Finally, we, in that context, recommend that um, if there's going to be off-site activities, social activities outside the school property, they should make sure they're only going to accessible venues so no student with disabilities is left out. Theme number 14, transportation. Some students get transported to and from school. Disproportionately, that includes students with disabilities. An accessibility standard was passed by the Ontario government over a decade ago in relation to transportation, and it has some provisions regarding student busing, but they have not solved the problem. So we make detailed recommendations on what should be done to ensure that, for example, there's always someone you can, as a parent, can call if there's a problem with the busing, who you can get in touch with in real time to make sure that drivers are properly trained on the individual needs of a student. And if, if a driver is replaced, that the replacement driver is trained on the needs of the students uh, in the bus relative to their transportation. Theme 15, we recommend steps to make sure that experiential learning and co-op learning is accessible. I mentioned at the start of my talk that, that people with disabilities face too many barriers in employment. The problem getting your first job is, all, is often that you don't have a, a letter of reference from a previous employer. Well, if a student with a disability can get a good co-op placement, that may produce the very letter of reference that can be a gateway to their first job. Yet, uh, there is not enough being done to ensure that students with disabilities get co-op placements or experiential placements. That requires uh, activity by school boards with the ministry providing models of how to do it and we make practical proposals in that regard. Theme number 16, ensuring that students with disabilities who need a service animal at school that's trained, a trained service animal, uh, faces no disability barriers in bringing that service animal to school. This has been a problem and continues to be identified as a problem. And uh, the provincial government uh, has uh, directed school boards to have policies in this area, but has not required those policies to be any good. So you'll find that the Kindergarten to Grade 12 Standards Development Committee makes practical recommendations on what should be required to make sure that the uh, students uh, who use a trained service animal uh, are uh, not impeded by unfair disability barriers when trying to bring that service animal to school. Uh, for example, uh, the animal would of course have to be properly trained, but if a school board has any concerns about allowing it, they've got to give the family prompt reasons for this. There has to be a fair process for deciding on it. There should be a first trial period to try it out. Don't just say, no, you can't do that, but give it a try, give it a try. And we, they should be looking to schools that have successfully done it because there are a number who have successfully allowed it and, uh, and so on. Look to our report for more details. Theme number 17, removing physical barriers. Many, if not most of our schools, we fear, are not physically accessible to students, teachers, family members, and others with disabilities. That is absurd, but it happens to be the status quo here. Our, our Ontario building code and existing AODA standards do not uh, require a school 
to be fully and properly accessible, or frankly, any other building. We offer detailed recommendations of what an accessible school should look like. Uh, we suggest also that they, uh, a school board shouldn't make things any worse, for example, by uh, if it has to downsize schools by closing a more accessible school and leaving open a less accessible school. That shouldn't be the way things uh, are done. We make recommendations as well about accessibility of playground equipment. Theme number 18, transitions. Students go through a lot of transitions at school. Transition into school, transition from one school to another, or from uh, elementary school to all the way up to post -sec uh, to secondary school, and then at the end of their education, uh, school education, transition to college, pardon me, university or community activity or work. It was a priority that there be effective transition uh, planning. One of our recommendations, there are many in the area of transitions, but one of our standards development committee's recommendations is that school boards should have system na uh, transition navigators to help students and their families through this. It's a multi-year process. And you need uh, the benefit of someone to help help you steer through that process. Theme number 19, planning for emergencies. Didn't think of this when we started our work, but when the COVID hit, man, we sure got a, we became aware of the importance of doing this. Uh, there are detailed recommendations, both arising out of this pandemic and for any future emergencies. To begin with, uh, there should be a, a, an independent review of how the needs of students with disabilities were met and whether how effective or ineffective it was during the pandemic. It's not appropriate to leave it to each school board to just figure out how to do it. So we call for the establishment in the future of an emergency dis students with disabilities command table at the ministry level to help oversee and make sure that uh, emergency planning covers the uh, urgent needs of students with disabilities. We also recommend comparable activity at the school board level. Uh, sc teachers, school boards, and others, certainly during the pandemic, were struggling to figure out what to do to meet the needs of all students, including students with disabilities. But there are lessons to be learned so that we don't have to keep reinventing the wheel. Theme number 20, the final theme in our recommendations, relates to enforcement and accountability. The Standards Development Committee, like many others, identifies that the AODA's enforcement and compliance systems in place to now, up to now, have not been particularly strong or effective. And there are detailed recommendations on uh, what should be done uh, to improve this. And one of the core messages, among many others, is not just enough for, for ministry uh, inspectors to look at uh, documents or files and say, hey, your paperwork on AODA compliance is all in order. Very good, you're doing great. It's important not to look just at the policies of a school board. It's important to look at the practices. Are there actual barriers? Are they being removed? Are they being prevented? Now, what can you do? Let me conclude this talk with some suggestions on what you can do with our report. Our report, when I say our, throughout I'm meaning the report of the Standards Development Committee. The first and important thing is please send in your feedback before September 2nd, either completing the, the government survey or just write up your own thoughts uh, and send them to the email address educationsdc at ontario.ca. I'll repeat that, it's educationsdc at ontario.ca. And in your feedback, if you don't have time to go through the whole report, go through our condensed 55 page version, the AODA Alliance's condensed version. And if you don't have time for that, go through the 15 page summary. Or just look at one of the sections that matters to you the most, read that and give your feedback on that. You don't have to have read everything before you can give feedback uh, on anything. Second, don't think of this as just a report uh, that it can be, will be used some years from now to develop a new regulation that some years after that somebody might start complying with. Think of it as a possible guide to action now. Um, I, I think it would be really helpful if each school board reviewed the Standards Development Committee's 185 pages, identified the recommendations that they think makes uh, 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 appeal to them and would be worthwhile doing in their view, I hope that includes all of them, and uh, look at which ones they can start implementing now. For example, nothing would stop a school board from immediately offering all families of students with disabilities a meeting to discuss their IEP. 
or what should go into it, which I discussed earlier. That would be a something you just develop a letter or an email, send it out, and it's done. Uh, that can be done now. We don't need new regulations or new policy from the province, though we would like that to come from the province. Um, uh, similarly, if a school board is involved in building a new building or a new school now or doing a major addition, which last summer the province said they were allocating a half a billion to those kind of projects, the school board should use the recommendations from the Standards Development Committee on what an accessible new school should include. That is available right now. It's available to, to use. They should use it. Uh, if you work in a school board, look at which uh, of these recommendations you could implement now. If you are a member of the public, let your school trustees and your school board know which ones you think they should be implementing right now. Use this report as a tool to help make social change take place right now. Um, if you are a teacher who, or a professor who teaches in teacher education programs, put this report on your curriculum. Get your students reading this and learning about it and discussing what they should be doing uh, uh, to ensure that students uh, can, uh, who become teachers uh, and educators know more uh, about all of these important barriers and how to overcome them. And finally, every school board in Ontario has to have what's called a Special Education Advisory Committee, or SEAC, S-E-A-C. They should be taking this report and making recommendations to the province on it too. They should also look at this report and select the, uh, uh, rec uh, the recommendations that they think are important and encourage their school board to implement those recommendations right now. They should also ask their school board to be sure to take into account their views uh, when the school board gives its feedback to the government this summer. Well, let me conclude by thanking you for taking the time to listen to this. I hope you will take part in the consultation process. Please share your ideas uh, with us. Uh, and don't worry whether they're good ideas or bad ideas. Any uh, thoughtful idea is worth considering. Let me conclude also by just listing, as I said I would, resources available to you. So you can look at the actual report of the K-12 Standards Development Committee. You can look at the 15-page or the 55-page uh, synthesis or summaries of them that the AODA Alliance applied, uh, prepared. Again, that's not uh, the, the K-12 uh, committee did not approve those, is not responsible for those, and shouldn't be blamed for those. Only blame us at the AODA Alliance if there's a problem with them. Um, similarly, uh, I encourage you to uh, look at the parents' video that I'm going to, uh, tips for parents' video that I'm uh, including with this. Uh, along with this video. Uh, and finally, uh, there is on the AODA Alliance website an action kit on how to take part in the public consultation process. If you want to learn more about what the AODA Alliance has done over the past 11 years to advocate on accessibility in the education system, go to aodaalliance.org slash education. Please follow us on Twitter at AODA Alliance, share our tweets, and please, please friend our Facebook page, which is, is facebook.com slash Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act Alliance. Thanks again for your time watching this. And let's bring our school system uh, to a condition of being barrier-free and fully accessible for all students, including all students with disabilities.